Will silver and gold save you during times of financial crisis? We've got a growing level of evidence pointing towards the fact that we might just be in trouble. As a silver and gold investor, you're going to be shocked at what you learn today. And what evidence do we have in the past that financial crisis do occur? And how did silver and gold perform during those periods? We need look no further than the great financial crisis in 08, the tech bubble in the year 2000, and the list goes on and on. Would we not be naive to think that it could never happen again? But Ted, I have a pressing question for you. This normalcy bias, everybody thinks that it'll never happen again. Are we in a period where we'll never have another financial crisis? Well, good morning, Ron. I'd like to thank you for having me on your station yet again. Uh, you have a fabulous audience, and I've connected with every one of you all that have connected with us. So if you've left a uh, an email or a comment, or a, I don't know if you got my phone calls or whatever, but uh, we've been back in touch with everyone. So, so far, there's been over 88, 89,000 views since we got started uh, last Friday. And uh, right now, I think we're up to 1,200 comments and the number is growing. So actually, we are giving out some great information. But to get back to your question, if you're holding real money that's been God's money for thousands of years, I mean, as we talked about before, Judas was paid 30 pieces of silver to drop the dime on Jesus, right? That silver is still around. It doesn't disintegrate. As a matter of fact, when silver goes to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean or Pacific Ocean or where it happens to be, you may think it disintegrates like stock certificates or notes or, or cash or whatever else. No, no, no. Uh -uh. There are companies that are that are uh, situated on the stock exchange that actually have investors to go after certain sunken treasures. Now, why would they go after sunken treasures with silver and gold? Jeez, I don't know. Uh, can you <laughs> maybe it's because it's real money. Well, we had a lot of fun things to get into today. One of the things that you shared with Ron is something I've never done before is to share my personal currency collection. And I think that uh, you if you to pull that up, Ted, you want me to pull yeah, that why up? Don't take a look at that, because okay. this will answer your question definitively. OK, so will we will the question being, are we possibly just possibly going to have another period of financial turmoil? during our lifetimes, maybe during the next year, right? That's what we're looking at here and, and how silver and gold have fared during those times. So I am going to pull up Ted's currency picture. There it is, Ted, on the screen right now. Okay. So folks, if we could take a look at a couple of these things down in the center, okay, you see the 10 million uh, uh, right mark there. Okay. Underneath of that, what I did was I put one note on top of the other that was blank on the back. The reason being is they ran out of ink. They were printing so much of this. So what I wanted to show you is all the different currency notes that are not all of them, but that series of currency notes that have been used throughout the world. Now, if we can go, Ron, real quick over to Bank for International Settlements, because I'd like you to know who issues this and who actually got the silver for these notes that you are now holding that are worthless. OK, so if we go over to the International Bank for International Settlements. We talked about this before. BIS.org. I'll show you who actually creates these uh, these currency notes. I'm working on it behind the scenes here, Ted. Well, that's, okay. that's all right. But what you'll see is these are real. Somebody had these things. They folded them up. They carried them in their back pocket. And they used it to buy bread or food or pay rent or pay their taxes or whatever else. So if that is, in fact, immutable wealth, what am I doing with it? Why would I invest in this? So what I'm trying to tell you is if we had laid down, say, a dime, a, a silver dime or any piece of silver on any one of those currency notes, those, those people now would have something that's actually worth money if they'd have been held in the money. So what are we going to do here is I'd like you to follow along. Ron, is there any way these people can download uh, BIS.org on their computer so they can pull this up themselves? Well, we, no, they will. We, we will just have them follow along with us, Ted. Okay. They're on the live stream here. So okay. we OK, so uh -huh. we're at Central Bank Hub. Is that where Correct. you want me to go? Absolutely right. We're going to go to Central Bank Hub on the on the front page and then go to Central Bank and Monetary Authority websites, the second line down. Yeah. OK. And then what do we do? Are we live stream right now? Why don't we ask somebody that's live to give us a letter of the alphabet that doesn't begin with the, uh, with the exception of the letter U. Somebody on there real quick. Give us a letter. What do we got? D? D. All right. All right let's, let's go, go to D. 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 There right. is D. Oh, that only has two central banks. <laughs> well, what I'm only wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice to own the central bank in, in, in Denmark? 
Or how about Dominican Republic? I hear it's warm down there right now. Is it, folks? Anybody tuning in from the Dominican Republic? Or actually, why don't you go on? Because um, what I'm understanding is 44% of the people watching this are outside the United States. So if you're outside the United States, this website will work for you too. BIS.org. Find out who owns your currency, who owns your bank, and is the Bank for International Settlements. So if we scroll down some more, let's go past E. What Stop right there a minute. What we're looking at here are countries, countries, folks. These are countries in which the BIS provides the mandatory currency in each and every one of these countries. Right now, they're all fiat. They're all ready to go away exactly at the same time. And when they do, what do you think happens to the BIS.org, Ron? Uh, it probably goes away, collapses as well. I mean, we're looking at this, I think, on a big picture level, Ted, exactly. uh, this this and we always pull up Exeter's pyramid. But this fact that the whole monetary system, mm -hmm. everything outside of silver and gold has basically become very synthetic at this point, man made kind of like uh, in the cars <laughs> and like like fake leather in a, in a car. Uh -huh. And uh, and and as we as we face you know, a potential for uh, for just even parts of that system falling apart that that we could see a wave of new money coming into the silver and gold sector. Is that is that safe to say? Uh, new money. How about new demand for money? OK, ah. which is going to be satisfied in currency notes. Yeah. I mean, come on, folks. Um, let's be real here. OK, ninety nine point five percent of you don't have any money at all. OK, that's the fact. A lot of you are holding the script of a failing country, failing government, excuse me, which is the United States government. I mean, I, I'm hearing all kinds of things happening in, in terms of uh, bad things with regards to the government. How much confidence do you think Joe Biden instilled in the public the other night? So the, the respect for the dollar is dying. The usage of the dollar is dying. So let me tell you a story about what just happened over in China. So in China, the people that might be uh, coming to visit the United States, what's happened is the bank over there in China are handing out counterfeit U.S. notes, counterfeit $100 U.S. notes. They're giving them to the Chinese people to, uh, to bring back to the United States and use as currency, but it's being caught. So let me see. The dollar is being uh, counterfeited. The dollar isn't worth anything. What you're holding could or may not be a real authentic printed note from the Bank for International Settlements. But one thing is for sure is that the pendulum always swings in both directions. OK, so we are all fiat right now. All right. And what's going to happen is, bam, that that does that. That, that string is going to snap and the pendulum is going to go woof, right around and stick to the other side for quite a while. Because fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Now, we are the only country on the face of the planet here in the United States, whose generations have never seen a currency reset. So if you go back and take a look at those notes, you'll see that some of these countries have had numerous iterations of currency in their country. My question is, when the new currency notes come out, are you redeemed for the old currency notes? And why not at this point in time, forget about the script. Come on, folks, let's get back to basics. Keep it simple and stupid. Get the money of your country. The money of your country, if you're in the United States of America, are American silver eagles, okay? And pre-65 dimes, quarters, and half dollars. So against the dimes, silver is the best place to be right now, folks. I'm 65. I've started and sold three businesses. I don't make mistakes. And 65 years of age, I mean, <laughs> you don't know me well. I, I would suggest you do a little bit of research. Look at this. This is one of the last uh, years of just one of the uh, certificates that I had. Can you see that? Okay. There we go. Yep. Yep. There we go. Okay. So I sold the practice in 2010. All right. So I was closing it down at that time. But anyway, it shows you who I am. And originally we're thinking, oh, we ought to keep me quiet. You know, forget about, uh, you know, uh, forget about Ted's concern about somebody knocking on his door and putting a gun to his head. Why in the world would you do that? That's crazy. I have more information that will help you. <laughs> the death will help you, hurt you. you know, good grief. Yeah. So, you know, Ted, I want to throw something in as we're talking about this, this potential, right? For none of us has a crystal ball. Potential. There's over there seems to be overwhelming evidence. Uh if 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 we look at this from for, through two perspectives. Number one, historically, 
which you showed with that big collection of money, we can. It doesn't take much of a study of history to see that that over over history, currencies have collapsed, right? Especially fiat-based currencies have collapsed. Mm -hmm. Now, if we zoom in on right now, okay. Well, let me back up, and we, and we know that when those historic currency crisis had erupted, whether it was uh, in England and and France and Spain and the oh. Roman Empire, that that silver and gold held their value. Silver and gold held their value. So if we fast forward to today, so we know that that history tells us. Now, we know also that today we all suffer from normalcy bias. Some people call it recency bias. Like me, I'm 54 years old. My parents are 80. Even them, like they just have never, the bank has always been a safe place to put the money, right? And they're 80 years old. I'm 54. The bank has always been a safe place to put my money. But if we look at what's going on right now, evidence of what's going on right now, you've got some things you want to talk about that I think are going to be very interesting to our viewer, some evidence as to what's going on. And then when you're done with that, I want to talk about a modern day example right now in Egypt. But can I pull up your slides again? Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's your money collection. Bear no, with there's me. No, hold it, hold it, hold it. We got to be real. I'm sorry, but we got to call that uh, fiat currency, failed fiat currency. Okay. Yeah. That is not money. Money is the eagles. Okay. As we talked about. All right? right. Currency, when it can be exchanged back for the money, okay, is in fact called currency at that point. When you can no longer take the currency notes back to the bank and get the silver back that you gave them in exchange for the currency notes, then the note has become fiat currency. And then when they create so much of this as they did back in the Weimar Republic, they ran out of ink and then they ran out of paper. I heard you heard it. this. Is, everything I'm telling you is true, folks. Research it on your own. OK, but once they ran out of paper and they ran out of ink, you know what they did next? They digitized it all. How much does it cost to create a digit on a computer screen? Actually, a digit isn't it recommend. Actually, aren't digits rec uh, represented by electrons? And yeah. isn't electron denoted by a negative sign? I mean, gosh, the God's out there. He's telling you what's going on, folks. We're trying to save you. This will save you. OK. And as far as all this tax talk, geez, should we let somebody else hold our money so we keep the other 35 percent of the taxes that we would have had to give up to hold it ourselves? Well, my suggestion is this. What is the history of taxes? Do you know during the Reagan administration, the highest uh, marginal tax rate was 90 percent? I kid you not. And then they had something on top of that called an alternative minimum tax. Then they had something on top of that called an excise tax. And we spoke about that a little bit a little while ago when I was doing the estate planning, that some of the leftover IRAs with whack with 106 percent taxes. You owe more on the IRA than the IRA would be worth. So things are changing. OK, what will be in your hand after all this stuff months down, as we've been talking about with extras pyramid, is this. Can you tell me what the risk is? If you're holding this yourself, there's no counterparty risk. I can wake up in the middle of the night and put my hand around this thing and shake it and wake Margaret Ann up and say, hi. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> All right. So, Ted, 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 do me a favor. Hold that, that, that tube of 20 American Sea. Hold it right up close to the camera. So we're going to ask our viewers, would you rather have that or this? Oh, hold on, Ted. I pulled oh. up the picture. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good huh? idea, Ron. <laughs> Would you rather yeah. because because uh, how much is everything on that table worth outside of collector's value? It's you worth mean, what did what did I pay with for it? Is that what the question is? Yeah, because it's really only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it, right? Right. Okay, so right. here's your real money. Okay. Yeah. All right, there's your real money. You yeah. know how much I paid for all those currency notes? Zero, zero. Because we have helped helped so many people for so many years. Some of these notes are gifts from people. Some of them are gifts from uh, coin stop owners because we're not we don't make any money on anything. I'm not marking anything up because I want you to have as much silver as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. If you have thirty one dollars in your pocket, go out and get an eagle. And if somebody's going to charge you seven percent to move your hundred or two hundred thousand dollars over two hundred thousand times seven percent is fourteen thousand dollars. I get you almost an entire monster box. Can we pull up that uh, chart that I sent over to you earlier today? Because a couple of people are wondering just how much silver do I have to have to be in the game? And what I'd like to do yeah. is show you this. 
Ron, uh, do you remember that chart that was sent over yep. with how many I'm, ounces I'm of silver? On it. I'm on it, Ted. Hold on. Is this what I you're know? You are. You're a good man. You're a good man. So what, the, folks? Dag on it. Get a copy of this. If you don't get a copy of this, call me and and or or email me, Ted I mean, at TedSpeaks.net, or get a hold of Ron. You got to have this. Everybody in our group that is stacking silver has this, and they're all looking to how much more do I need to get to the next level? Okay. Now some people are up to like over 100 monster boxes and some people are just sort of getting started i can tell you one of the guys in our group he's a spectacular guy he's a home improvement contractor single guy he started talking to me about 10 years ago and he saw the light and he sold his house he sold his house he had three houses prior took all the equity from the third house and now he's renting what's called a frog a finished room over garage i kid you not his name is dave all right and what he's doing is he's stacking as hard as he can. And every time he comes up with another six, seven hundred dollars, he goes out and buys another tube. All right. So those tubes add up the well, actually, the tubes, the ounces add up the tubes, the tubes add up this monster boxes. There's 25 tubes in a monster box. The monster boxes add up to generational wealth. Yeah. Folks, if you can come out of this depression, recession, whatever you want to call it right now, with assets, real assets you can hold in your hand. You will have generational wealth because 99.5% of the other people out there have nothing. So when all their wealth melts down into your hand, they're going to be crying the blues and you're going to be walking away, clicking your heels. But I'm not going to feel bad about it because I already told you about this stuff. So Ron has just put up something called snowball derivatives. Okay. That's where we are right now. And the difference between a snowball derivative and a debt avalanche, a debt avalanche is when you have a whole bunch of credit cards and you're making a minimum payment and you try to take any extra money at the end of each month to pay down the principal. However, when things get real bad, what happens is the investors out there, they put these uh, these these bad uh, credit card debts and everything into what's called a derivative. OK, and those derivatives trade within a certain range of each other. But once they trade outside that range, that's when the green arrows go to red. And you wind up with, um, geez, what is a very, very large snowball called? I mean, uh, it's not an avalanche because that would be the side of a mountain coming down. But this is this is a, a, a new economic phenomenon that you will be hearing shortly about what the heck it is and what actually what the heck it was and what it did. I'm telling you what it is before it does and what it's going to affect before it does. OK, it's going to affect the stock market. OK. So let's go back to that other slide there, Ron, and let me explain the difference between snowball derivatives and a debt avalanche. And Which I'll show slide? you on two different sides. Um, that slide number was this slide, one here. Here it is. It's up. It's up. Slide, slide number two. Okay. Imagine so, that it went from one to two, Ted. You are organized. And uh, I just want to say something real quickly to everyone. Number one, thank that's you. My wife. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here, right? The viewer. Again, it's not Ted Tube, it's not Ron Tube, it's YouTube. So we do appreciate you joining us and talking about this, which are very critical issues that I think a lot of us silver and gold investors want to talk about. I also forgot to really introduce Ted. Ted's with Ted Speaks. Uh, all of his contact information, including Twitter, YouTube channel, email address, will be in the description of this video. And without further ado, Ted, talk to us about a debt avalanche versus a debt snowball. Well, I'd like to know what to do is first. You told me you didn't, might have to go. <laughs> anyway, so the debt avalanche versus the debt snowball. A debt avalanche, what that does is it prioritizes, and prioritizes the interest rate. So obviously, let's suppose you have 20 some credit cards out there. You'd want to start with the highest interest rate first, okay? And then pay more towards the higher interest rate each and every month in order to pay it down a little bit faster. That's a slow way, okay? Um, the other way is where the derivatives didn't really get wiped out, okay? And as we had talked about before, derivatives and derivative holders have a superior lien on your account. And this is what's called in the Dodd-Frank Act, okay, um, as a bail-in. Now, you should have a, um, a, a, chart, a slide on bail-ins, all right? So a bail-in, basically, Ron, that was slide number three for today, okay? So a bail-in is you, we're familiar with a bailout, right? That's what happened back in 2008 with that troubled uh, asset relief program. The two point some trillion dollars, everybody got their hand in a cookie jar and left home and you know, they were all fat and happy, but except for us, right? So a bail in, okay, as opposed to a bailout, a bailout is when the government comes down and bails out the banks, 
That's not going to happen next time. Next time is what's called a bail-in. And folks, this is really what put the fire under my belly. Um, because what happened in 2003, I started learning about the, the, the silver and what was going on with the digits and stocks not being real and all that stuff. We'll cover that. Okay. But when, um, uh, what, 2013, what's? 2013, not 2000. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. So anyway, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> about the stocks. Okay. About the, the money. All right. So, the bail-in. The bail-in. Bail 2013. Okay. So the bail-in, what that is, is that's when the banks take the depositors' money and use that to make the bank, or actually use that to hydrate or to reimburse the derivative holders. Now, the derivatives are in the quadrillions. There's way more quadrillions than there are dollars. So if we were to go back to U.S. debt clock a little later on, I don't want to do that right now, you'll see that the total amount of money in the checkbook in order to honor the checks or which are $655 trillion, you have $665, $655 trillion of debt and only $20 trillion in the checkbook. If you had $655,000 of debt and you only had $20,000 in the checkbook, you got a problem, right? I'm pointing this out to you. And um, I don't think I'm going to get emotional anymore because we're past that point. You know, first time, this is a different time here. You already know this now. If you don't take action, it's your fault. You're going to wind up with nothing. And you've been talking, seeing this. You know that silver is money. We've talked about it. You're talking to a certified financial planner, certified estate planner, 27 years in, in practice, 15 years as a radio personality, never challenged, never, never been objected to. You guys are welcome to do that. But there were attorneys and CPAs, all kinds of leopards and snakes were out there trying to get me. Not one of them. Because you speak the truth, you don't have a problem. 15 years in Baltimore, Maryland. Check it out, okay? Yeah. But the bottom line is this is real, okay? This is not real. This is the $5 note I originally showed you that's issued by, this one's here is issued by the United States, okay? However, this one here was issued by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, if you go back to the Bank of International Settlements, you can find out that the Federal Reserve is actually underneath the United States of America. They own the banks in America. We do not own our own bank. Okay? So let's get that straight. So a bail-in is when the, um, when the banks take your money to make up for the losses they've incurred in the stock market. So why is this important? Well, why are bail-ins happening? Well, bail-ins are happening because... Um, what was his name? Oh, um, oh, Clinton. Bill Clinton repealed the Glass-Steagall Act. Let's take a look at the Glass-Steagall Act here. That is slide number seven, Ron. Okay. So this is the, the Glass-Steagall Act. All right. I'm going to pull it up, Ted. Okay. It's on the I'm gonna screen. Keep going. I'm going to keep going. Okay. okay. Yep. The Glass-Steagall Act was placed in effect to stop commercial banks from investing in the stock market. So they take deposits that are supposed to be insured and they speculate in the stock market. Well, that was the cause of the Great Depression because the people that had shorts and uh, margins and all that kind of stuff going on in their accounts, they got out first. And they, they, they took all the cash. And that's why there was a Great Depression. It was a, a withdrawal in liquidity. OK, so what's happened right now is we've had the Glass-Steagall Act repealed by Bill Clinton. It should have never been repealed. The place where you invest your safe money should not be the place where you're investing in the stock market. Okay. So that's what's called the Glass-Steagall Act. And that was designed to be put into place and was put in place in order to stop the Great Depression remember happening again. But when Bill Clinton repealed it, there we go. So what hey, I'd like Dad, to do right hey, now. Dad, I want to ahead. throw something in that I think is important for people to realize. Just to make sure everyone understands what Ted is saying. Uh, it used to be if you put $100,000 in the bank that the bank couldn't take your 100000 and throw it into the stock market or make a risky investment. And that uh, that was the Glass-Steagall Act that prohibited banks from doing that. Um, and now that's been partially uh, changed or completely repealed. Repealed. Whole been repealed. Yeah. And that. And that yeah. And and um, and I think what this kind of goes back to, I want to I want to go back further, a little bit further in history. I think it's important for us to realize as well that maybe there's a reason why Thomas Jefferson said that the biggest threat to our country is not an invading army, but big banks, big central banks. You know, maybe Andrew Jackson was on to something with what he said about central banks uh, and banking in general, uh, that these banks kind of 
can take over everything and create massive issues. And then they always say, oh, it'll never happen again, right? Like we talked about earlier, it'll never happen again. And the yeah. one thing we knew, the one, yeah, we Trust promised me. we're better right. this time. Just right. we may need you to bail us out in the future. Mm -hmm. But the one thing we know, if we look throughout history, again, I want to reiterate this point, silver and gold have always acted as a very effective safe harbor, whether it's against banking issues in the United States, Europe, anywhere in the world, fiat, money printing, unicorn fart desk, whatever you want to call it, uh, financial shenanigans, synthetic derivatives, whatever it is, silver and gold have seen the story before and they've always, uh, always, always endured. The question I have for you, are any of those investments that you have directly avail? Uh, can you directly convert them into silver? real money, as the Constitution says. You know, we talked about the Constitution before, Article 1, Section 10, the United States Constitution. And we brought this up, that Article 1, Section 10 says the only thing we're supposed to be using in the United States is gold and silver as money. So what is the Federal Reserve note? Is that gold and silver? No. It, basically, it was a corrupt group that was able to take control of our government, buy out the top seats, and could take the power of the people away. And that was done up in 18, uh, to, up until 1871. We were on a silver standard. And then in 1871, a whole lot of turmoil happened. They didn't like the fact that the people had the power. So in 1871, they went from a silver standard to a quasi, what's called a bimetal standard, partially silver, partially gold. And basically, once they had their foot in the door to get the public away from just all silver, then they gradually shifted silver away from the uh, from the use of money as current currency actually uh, no use of money okay to gold and what that what did that do to the working class and the poor and the middle class it took their purchasing power away from them so basically from the time that we went I would say from 1871 up to right now which is what 170 years and isn't that the same number of years that Bix Weir's been talking about interesting huh so in 1871 the power went from the people to the wealthy because the wealthy were holding the gold, okay? Then in August 15th of 1971, what happened? Ron, Nixon took uh, us off the gold standard temporarily, right? I, I remember, Ted, I was one year old and I was very upset. My mom wondered why I was crying so much during that year. Oh my God. <laughs> I thought we were closer in age than that. Uh, I'm gonna need a moment, folks. <laughs> Now, uh, when you folks realize that the assets that you thought you owned were going to find out very quickly that those have been used as collateral in the derivative complex, you're going to hit the roof because it's all going to melt down. You're going to find yourself at the back of the line. Let me read you a quote that George Bush put out. OK, you know, if the people were to ever find out what we've done, we would be chased down in the streets and lynched. So, remember we talked about the stock certificates. Give us your old junky stock certificates, like the junk silver, okay? And we'll put your stock certificates and you your stocks in an account. Well, what happened was you lost this unique identifier here called a QCIP number. If it wasn't important, why was it there? You have to have a unique identifier with what you have. Otherwise, there's no real proof of ownership. And look at the beautiful logo that's in the center here. Now, look at the unique identifier here and look at the beautiful artwork that's in there. Look at this. You don't have any of that now. OK, you don't have a unique identifier. It's all simply digits on a computer screen. So a question I would have, if all your wealth or even a million or two of your million or wealth is in uh, digital form, who's keeping track of the digits? Who's keeping track of the digits? If you had this, you could prove that you, what you own, you own. But if you don't have the computer that has your digits in it, how are you going to be able to prove you even own it? You you gave up ownership of your certificate voluntarily. And I'm sorry I was part of that, but I'm making a tone for that right now. Well, what and about you, Ted? What about what about uh that 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 tube of silver eagles that you like to hold up so much, right? I mean, has that become almost as we move into this modern, quote unquote, whatever you want to call it, system where everything's electronic, everything's synthetic? I think you could even say okay. that it's almost that case to a certain degree with 
stock certificates that there's very few things left that you can actually hold that are real money. Is that, I mean, really, that's almost, is that it? I'm having a breakthrough moment here, Ted. That's really about it. Everything above silver and gold is synthetic, is man-made, right. make, make believe. So let me ask you a question, okay? Okay. These stock certificates, what do you think they're worth right now? Zero. Uh, yeah. They're zero, okay? What is this worth right now? About $28, I think. Well, that'd be $16,000 a monster box. Yeah, you're right in the ballpark there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right? Now, if you want to buy paper silver, which you own by 393 other people, okay, that'll be a little bit cheaper. It'll be like 2450 okay? Now, if you want to go physical, the cheapest way to buy physical is a thousand ounce bar. But unless you're running around in that neighborhood and you're running around with those folks that are swapping at thousand ounce bars back and forth as money, you come in with one or two thousand ounce bars. How do they know the bar is real? So in the event that you're holding a bar, OK, and you want to redeem it. And let's suppose you bought the bar through some company and they send it over to some vault. OK. Obviously, the, the serial number of the bar is not something you're going to be able to replicate. So you're not going to be able to take it back to where you bought it and, and prove to them that you have the bar number that they had sold you. OK, so you lose that provenance. All right. We talked a little bit about that before. So now that you've lost that, that, that uh, now that you're holding that thousand ounce bar, where are you going to take it? It weighs about 40 some pounds. You're going to have to take it either to a pawn shop or a coin store. And the laws in the state of Maryland are, especially in Baltimore County and Carroll County, which is where I live, is that the coin store or the pawn shop must hold onto that bar for a minimum of eight to 14 days, depending upon the county. And then a police report run to find out whether or not the bar was stolen. Now, if the bar is stolen, how much money do you think that the coin store uh, owner will get back from you for having bought that bar from you? No, you're long gone. So if that's a possibility, plus he has to wait eight to 14 days to get his money back, and you're going in there with a $23,000 or $24,000 bar, how much of that $24,000 are you actually going to get because of all the risk that's involved in knowing whether or not the bar is real, whether or not it's stolen, and then how are you going to negotiate? That's a $23,000 bill you got there. How are you going to go out and buy a newspaper or whatever with that? You got to have your funds divisible. So you're not in the crowd for 1,000-ounce bars. You're not in the crowd for 100-ounce bars. I don't think you're in the crowd for 10-ounce bars as long as there are American Silver Eagles available. Think of this as the real crab that's in the soup, okay? And think of all the other stuff that they keep putting in, watered-down soup. What we're really yeah. going to do— what we really and, and I, and I want to reiterate something to the, to the audience as well. There's a lot of differing opinions as to what's the best silver to stack. Ted's giving us his opinion— uh, my opinion uh, is very similar to his, although I do have a few bars and like a lot of you out there, right? Uh, there's there's a big uh, differing opinion in terms of what's the best silver. Some people just say uh, it all that matters is ounces, right? But then there's this uh, currency of the land uh, argument. So there, there's a lot. I think what's important is that listen to Ted listen to other people, maybe even listen to me a little bit, but form your own opinion in terms of what you're comfortable with. Would, you, would you say that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know. So it really, if you think of, you got to think of this upside down. Okay. You can't think of it the way they want you to think of it. You don't want to buy the cheapest silver out there. You want the best bang for the buck. A friend of mine once said, Ted, why don't you go first class? It only costs 10% more. But the thing is, is that it's not so much about what you buy the silver for. It's what you can use the silver for. Okay. So if you have the most fungible type of silver in your country, again, like if you're in Canada, it would be the maple leaf, United States, the American silver eagle, and vice, and the same sort of thing in every country around the world. You all have your own currency and your own fiat currency notes. I'm telling you, the BIS is being bankrupted. All those central banks they have all around the world, they're being pulled out. They really are, Ron. I've been yeah. studying this for 11 and a half years. This is what's happening. It's been well planned. So as the BIS is ripped out, okay, we have a new currency that's going to go in. But see, let's think of this as a patient on a gurney and he goes into the final operation. Now we've had him prepared, you know, we softened him up and we've got him drugged up and that kind of thing. You know, he's had all this stuff and oh my gosh, the, the economic U S economic patient, the global economic patient is just on the gurney. They're ready to die. All right. So they're on a heart rate machine to keep them going because they got to disconnect the heart. They got to disconnect 
what is currently running the global financial system, which is the Bank for International Settlements, Keynesian economic model. That's what's happening. It's never happened before. So somebody can tell you what the date or the time is. Uh, I'd look at that with a jaundice eye because I don't know. And I'm pretty well connected, I think. Um, the names you want to watch for are Dr. Judy Shelton. I believe she's going to be the new director of the United States Treasury. She's a very sharp gal. You should do some research on her because if you're concerned, you're thinking about, oh, do I go, should I go out and buy silver? Should I have my gold or should I hold stocks? You listen to Je Je Judy Shelton. She'll yeah. tell you exactly what she needs to do. And, and if you don't get the good vibes from her, I think you need to take off your glasses because she is one sharp gal and she's a patriot. She's very sharp. And she was approved by or appointed by President Trump to sit on the Federal Reserve Board. Dr. Judy Shelton, S H E L T O N. Okay. These are the players in the new in the new economic in the new economy. But you got to be holding the money. You got to be holding the money. And yeah. ideally, the coin of the realm, which is the United States, is American silver eagles. Canada, you want to be holding uh, maple leaves. Okay. Okay. Hey, Ted, I'm going to take a quick break here. Give you a quick break, and I want to say. Thank you to our sponsors. I want to start with Pimbex, where my finger is there, P-I-M-B-E-X. They sponsor Ron's Basement Online Bullion Dealer. If you're shopping to buy silver, gold, or platinum online, do yourself a favor. Throw them into the mix. I'm never going to tell you what to do, but compare what you can get from Pimbex to what you can get from other online bullion dealers. I think you'll find what I found when sev several of you basement dwellers recommended I check out Pimbex, and that is you're going to get the same metal at a better price. You're going to have a great selection and a great customer service experience. Pimbex, P-I-M-B-E-X. I love to spell it. I love to say it. And I love to get more metal for my money. Now, I also want to say thank you to Fortuna Silver Mines. I'll be interviewing Jorge Ganoza, the CEO of Fortuna Silver tomorrow morning. They just came out with their fourth quarter 2023 numbers. Unbelievable amount of cash flow generated. A company that's been being built over the last 20 years. You can learn more about them at fortunasilver.com. And of course, our friends at First Mining Gold. Uh, we, we have Dan Wilton, the CEO, Keith Newmeyer, the founder and chairman of the company, uh, two five million ounce deposits in Canada. You can learn more about them at firstmininggold.com. Thank you to all our sponsors for making Ron's Basement possible. Ted, I have a question for you. Sure. Do you think, do you think, Ted, that we are going to see a day? I hear some other people on YouTube talk about this from time to time where a person could potentially Buy something like a small house for a hundred dollars. I'm sorry, a hundred ounces. See, I'm brand, I'm, I'm a dollar thinker. A hundred ounces of silver. Have you ever heard that notion? Well, rather than me try to pontificate or opine on it, why don't we deal with the facts? The facts are is that during the Weimar Republic, you used to be able to buy a very, very nice house for around three or four ounces of gold. And why is that? Because they created so many units of currency. As I said before, they ran out of ink. Remember the picture I just showed you, the currency notes on the back? They ran out of ink. They were creating so much of it. Now, in our case, in the United States, they've not only run out of ink, they run out of paper and they digitized the whole thing. So look down at the bottom here, right in the center. You see the note that's blank, that's turned over on top, the note that's, uh, that's printed on? That is the back side of another note, exactly like that one. They had to make the, the currency, the fiat currency, as cheaply as possible because it wasn't worth any money to print it in the first place. OK, so if uh, you see this here, OK, that's the back of this one. All right. So this is the front. OK. And they ran out of ink and that's the back. This is the back of that one. And that's the front. OK, so I'm not pulling any games here. This is the way it worked. And they ran out of paper and they started printing it on uh, bamboo. So the thing is, is that what is really worth your time for the for the currency note that they're giving you in exchange for your time? Well, what I would suggest is that we go back and we take another look at this Dodd-Frank Act, because in the middle of the night, they stole the money from you. In 1965, all right, I guess I got full screen here. Yeah. In 1965, okay, actually 1964, they stole the money from our money, okay? So this is 1964 and earlier silver. That is still money, okay? Now, can you hear it? Listen to that, okay, compared to this. 
All right. You hear the difference? Okay, look. I, I can hear it. Ting, can, you, can you hear the difference? Yes, definitely. So this has a higher ting to it. It's called sound money. Okay? Golly days. I mean, cheesy peasy. You guys need to... I don't have the date, but I'm telling you, it's soon approaching. And when the date happens, your ability to do anything about it is over, okay? So think of it like this. You're showing up to a concert, okay? And you get there like I did 11 and a half years ago. And the warm-up band, when you started playing at that point, how do you even know the concert was going to begin? Well, anyway, I figured it out. And um, what the clue was, was that I was told, watch out for bail-ins. Well, when that bail-in happened in Cyprus in 2013, that scared the pants off of me because then I realized for sure that what I was being taught and what, what I was learning is true. And that's when I lit the candle and I did everything I could to get into the MIT Austrian Monetary Economics Program. I only had 25 people they led into it. It was taught, caught, taught by Dr. Antal Fakete. Do some research. This guy's the bomb, or at least he was. Um, but anyway, Austrian Monetary Economics is always where this uh, the, these fiat currencies run back to. Because once they've run their course, what is there left? It snaps back. And so I'm not making this up. I mean, it, it, it's history. This is the way it goes. Look at all the examples of the failed currencies that you had on that desk back there. Every one of them went through the same process. They all hyperinflate. Then people lose the confidence and they go back to sound money. OK, what is helping us to lose the confidence here is the fact that the Chinese government is giving out fake hundred dollar bills to their Chinese travelers coming to the U.S. trying to pass them off as real notes. Now, why do you think they're doing that? Maybe because we did it to them. Is it possible we sent some gold bars over there that were actually gold-covered tungsten bars because the specific gravity is very same? Check it out. What is, just ask this Google question. What is the specific gravity of tungsten, and what is the specific gravity of gold? 39.1, 39.3. So there's very, very little difference in the density. So you cover that thing with a, with a gold wrapper or you go, go coat it or whatever and ship it out to China in exchange for paying some bills. Isn't that a lot like watering down the money supply and inflating it? Ron, I asked for your for your What do you think? Yeah, yeah I mean, oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. That would be a form of printing gold, although we don't have definitive evidence that that had, has, has occurred in the past. I know I've heard that notion before that, oh, the you know, the gold bars are, are tungsten wrapped in gold. There's been no oh, definitive. Yeah. What's China, that? China actually discovered gold. Oh, gold. right. Yes. yes, they did. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. And the other thing I want to mention is what we're talking about here is the sky is falling. The sky is falling. Right. Uh, we're in, you know, that we're in all this big trouble. Oh, my gosh. Blah, blah. I want to say two things about that. We don't know for sure when or even, you know, it sure seems like things can happen or if things are going to happen. But we do know, right? So, so you know, I, I kind of felt the same way five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, so I want to emphasize that point. But I also want to emphasize also that if we look at, for example, that table of paper currency that you have, all of which are now worthless, we do know that throughout history, these things have happened. And I, and I want to repeat the point. I think it's that, you know, most people just have fallen asleep and I guess it's normalcy bias, right? Like, well, the banks have always been open and the banks have always been a good place to store my money. Um, that doesn't mean, I mean, nothing goes on forever. And again, if we look at history, uh, you know, even though we can't, I'll, I'll repeat, I love when Rick Wool says, don't confuse uh, that which is inevitable with that which is imminent, right? That we don't know for sure uh, what's going to happen, but we do know, and I'll and I'll and I'll and I'll end with this point before I hand it back to Ted. We do know that silver and gold, for thousands of years, have always held their value. Well, they, they have indeed. And uh, you had made a comment about um, uh, gold, and uh, I, I, what was that comment that you made? And uh, I wanted to expound on that a little bit, uh, but. Jeez. So much information I'm trying to get out to people and trying to speak as fast as I can. Sometimes thoughts come in when Ron is speaking. Oh, I ought to mention that. I mean, you're looking yeah. at 27 years worth of experience trying to get out right before the dollar crashes. 
So why do you think I chose this point in time now? I decided to throw caution to the wind, folks, because the time is nigh. Get the cash and get it into real money. Real money in America is American Silver Eagles. Get the cash out of bank account, savings account. Trust yourself first. And then as far as those of you that are taking a hit on uh, or, or, or thinking about avoiding a tax hit from rolling your money out of an IRA or 401k in the silver and using all kinds of third parties, I, again, I would suggest that you take the 35% tax hit. You get the cash, you get the money, and you get the uh, silver in your own possession and fall asleep on it and sleep tight. So, yeah, but I, I also want to mention Ted, uh, that we want to be careful with financial advice, right? That's Ted's opinion. Uh, my, my channel, we aren't offering financial or tax planning advice. You know, listen to Ted, listen to other people, maybe talk to a, a tax advisor, financial advisor, and then make up, you know, decisions for yourself. Yeah, I, I understand. I get a little fast and loose with that because Jesus did yeah. it for 27 years. It's sort of hard to say, oh, I can't talk about that. Because <laughs> it's the wrong day. <laughs> well, I mean, you were a financial planner, right? Yes. Um, right. I, I mean, did all this stuff. 20, I set up the trust. Yeah, I did I all the tax work, yeah. legal work. Ted, you know, Ted, what Ted, I did. Ted, Ted worked his entire career as a financial planner. So I think it's easy for you to fall into financial yeah. planner mode. But I want to emphasize for the audience that we aren't, you know, on, on my channel, I'm not giving financial advice. Uh, uh, you know, Ted is free to say, obviously, whatever he likes, but just, you know, use your uh, the resources that are available to you, uh, you know, including uh, financial planners, other people out there. The reason why I reached out to you uh, in, uh, in, in with a prayer to see if you'd have me on today is because yeah. of this. Yeah. The bank bank term funding program, folks, ends at midnight tonight. OK, and we know that we just had to move our clocks ahead as well. All right. If you want any of this information, please send a, an email uh, to Ted at TedSpeaks.net. OK, if you have any trepidations, I don't know what more I can do. You got to get out of the digits and you got to get into the real silver because the real silver is finite. The real silver represents your labor, which is finite. It's been money for thousands of years. It's been money in thousands of countries for thousands of years, thousands of time over. Every time these other fiat currencies fail, they say, oh, well, this piece of paper is no good anymore. Try this one. Would you fall for that? No. It's a constant swing back and forth from fiat to real, from fiat to real. This time with President Donald Trump in office, the guy that came out of retirement, the guy that put up his own bucks, the guy that ran for office, the guy that's taken all the slings and arrows, the guy that's coordinating all this, and the guy that's looking for sheriffs and other aspect of our uh, of our economy here to bring law and order back to our economy. I think it's time we do that. And that's yeah. what we're talking about. But yeah. more importantly, right now, you got to get the money in your own hands. They're running out of this stuff. If you call Pimbex right now, I don't know how many monster boxes of American Type 1 and Silver Eagles are left. Call around. But once they're gone, don't give up. Then go after the dimes that they have. I talked to Mike down there. He says they have about 40,000 face of dimes. So each each bag of face dimes will run you probably around eighteen to $19,000. So what that means is that each dime is going to be worth about $1.80. OK, so if there's 14 dimes per ounce, do the math. You're looking at 14 times a dollar 80, which is 360 about uh, what, um, what four dollars roughly. What, what is that? Uh, can somebody do the math anyway? So yeah. what we're talking about is getting back to real money and getting back to the dimes will allow you to divide and divisive, divide the ounces that you have here in the 14 separate transactions if you hold the dimes. So my suggestion would be to hold the real money. So one of these would cost $32.40 at $18, $18,000 per thousand. So it'd be $18 per dime. Uh, so that is another good way to go with this. But again, I am a certif I was a certified financial planner, certified estate planner. And really we're not talking about investments. We're talking about taking investments that you have and turn them into money until the war is over here that we're fighting. OK, we're fighting a political war, we're fighting an economic war, we're fighting a, a near kinetic war, and uh, we're also fighting an informational war. OK, we're fight Ted, we're fighting a war between I love when you said that uh, between Keynesian economics 
in Austrian economics, Keynesian economics, meaning all that synthetic make-believe money, right? Banknotes, mm -hmm. paper money, electronic money, derivatives, all that. And Austrian economics, real, real money. I want to hone in here for a second, right? Because we talk about financial crisis, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this or 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 even even if we tone it back just a little bit, uh, let's say financial disruptions like we've had during the C nineteen crisis, during the mm -hmm. 08 financial crisis, we see the confluence right now. We see some evidence developing. You talked about the BTFP program, the bank term funding oh. program, which ends tomorrow. Right? Yes, tonight. Uh, tonight. tonight. Yeah. yeah, tonight. That could be a big deal. We know the reverse repo program has been being drained. I didn't see up to date uh, numbers for this week on that one, but that was kind of this what I called stealth QE program that the Fed had going on. We had Jerome Powell last week in uh, testifying to Congress, and he said he expects there to be a few banks <laughs> that fail. Uh -huh. and well, if I, I wait, 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 let me, let me, let me, let me finish here. That's okay. But I, I, let's 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 look at the forest through the trees. Our viewer who's with us is a smart person. Okay, so if Jerome Powell is in front of Congress, and if I have that correct, that he insinuated that we're going to have some banking trouble because of the commercial real estate problem. Think about what Jerome, Jerome Powell is paid to be the, to give the best spin on everything. So if we look back to that same Jerome Powell that said, oh, inflation's not a problem, inflation's temporary, inflation's transitory, uh, oh, we'll never have another, you know, these, these people at the top are paid to be as optimistic as possible. If that's his most optimistic assessment of what we have coming, could we be could we be in for more? And I'm going to let you speak for a second, but I want to pull up an article from a top real estate CEO where he warns us just of that. Go ahead, Ted. Sure. Yeah. What we're talking about is basically one bank using its credibility to guarantee or provide security and safety or kind words that the depositors will be okay. And what we're talking about in this particular example, more specifically, is what's called a CDO or collateralized debt obligation. Basically, let's suppose that you're JP Morgan and I'm Bank of America. Both of us are broke. We know that. We got more, more liabilities than we do assets. So what, when your outgo exceeds your upkeep, your income becomes your downfall. Remember that one? Okay. Yeah. So one more time, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. So the bottom line is, is that Bank of America has no money. They're upside down. Their derivative exposure is far greater than their asset base. Besides, whose asset base does that belong to? Well, I guess if it belongs to Dodd, <laughs> guess if we follow the Dodd-Frank Act, it sure as heck doesn't belong to you, does it? So the bottom line is we had Bank of America with no assets and we have Chase Manhattan Bank with no assets because they both have more derivatives than they do assets. So I'm not lying. It's the way it is. So we both have good names, though. So I say to Ron, hey, buddy, we're friends. I'll guarantee your bank if you guarantee mine. I'm JP Morgan, you're uh, Bank of America. So as long as we're leaning up against each other, we're back to back, okay? And it looks perfectly fine. We're supporting each other in terms of uh, smoke and mirrors, right? But what happens if my knees go out and I go down? Let's suppose that I go down, okay? And now what has to happen is Ron has to pony up with the money to take me to bring me back up. But Ron doesn't have any money. Ron's already broke himself. Now, do you think other banks got into this too? How about Signature Bank says, hey, we're, we don't have the name that you guys do, okay? But we'll guarantee your bank, your loans, if you guarantee ours. So it's a, it's a big charade. It's yeah. actually what's called Kabuki Theater. We're living in, Potemp in a Potemkin village. Look this stuff up, folks. We're living in a Potemkin village watching a Kabuki Theater, and none of it is real. It's the most exciting, fun thing. You guys got to get in on the party. But the only way you can get in on the party and have some fun is you remove the stress from yourself. If you take what you have, and let's suppose, as that that ch that uh, chart that he brought up, let's suppose that all you can do is put together, say, five or six monster boxes or whatever, okay? We're talking what it is you've saved, your life efforts. And that should be represented in something that's real, not something that's digit, and not something that's paper that can be inflated away and printed away, okay? So you have to hold your own money. If you don't, somebody else is holding it for you. So all these make so all, all these that if you if you don't hold it, somebody else does. If you don't hold it, uh, you don't own it. And what I'd like to add is, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. Guess who? We do. We own it. We got this. 
So yeah. if you're holding a script or a proxy for this, and we're holding the real thing for this, when all the when all this calamity happens, and it's going to happen, it folks, like a, it's going to happen like a switch and uh, a light switch being flipped. It's got to happen that way because you're looking at 7.8 billion people on the face of the planet. Now think about this for a minute. 7.8 billion people on the face of the planet. Think about how many transactions you conduct each and every day. Are you using electricity? Are you using water? Are you eating today? Whatever. Let's just suppose on the on the low side, we anticipate 2.5 transactions per day per person times 7.8 billion people. How many ounces of silver are going to need for that? Oh, we can't be measured in ounces, Mr. Provenza. We're going to have to measure it in something much smaller than that. Oh, really? Give me an idea. Well, we're thinking we might have to measure it in micrograms. Micrograms? What in the world is a, a microgram? Uh, milligram, sorry, milligram. What is a milligram? A milligram is a thousand of a gram. Yes, they're, they're monetizing and they're dealing in gold over there in Qatar by the milligram right now. So the deal is this. There's a thousand milligrams in one gram and there's 31.1 grams in one troy ounce. Now, there's another type of ounce that we use. It's called avant-poix. It comes from France. And basically, it means a weight of wool, so to speak. And that is, uh, that's a type of unit of weight that we typically use. Now, a unit, how many grams, the number of grams in avant-poix ounce is 28.8. So don't get cheated. You better keep a note of that. So don't confuse the number of ounces, standard ounces in the United States, denoted by avant-poix, okay? with troy ounces, which are 31.1 ounce, uh, troy, uh, 31.1 grams. Okay. So again, the troy ounces measures precious metals and the avant poix measures everything else. Okay. Hey, Ted. Yes. The sky, I have to remind you, the sky is falling right now, right? Uh, or at minimum, <laughs> what, <laughs> proof, <laughs> what, what, what proof do we have that we could be heading into this period of financial disruption. I'm going to pull up an article. I want you to read this. So I want to circle back to this, uh, what we what we could be facing here in the top in the next, you know, several months. Uh, this is from Fortune magazine, top real estate CEO, top real estate CEO, Barnes, 500 or more banks will either fail or be consolidated over the next two years. This has to do with the commercial real estate issue that we're fix that, that we're facing uh, as all these loans need to be rolled over and the collateral that backs the loans, empty office buildings are worth now maybe 60 cents, 70 cents, 40 cents, whatever on the dollar, that that this is going to put huge stress on the banking sector. Any any thoughts on that? You put a lot of eggs in the blender that time, buddy, and there's a lot we got to get on scramble. <laughs> I mean, holy cow. I mean, I wanted to stop you a couple of different times there, but, uh, you know, it's your show and I'm trying to be polite. So, Let's take a look at this right now. Look at this. This is the home sales. It's falling off a cliff. So why was the home sales going so robust? Why was it going the greatest ever? Because money was made so cheap. Okay. I'm in a fairly nice neighborhood. And it was all filled with CEOs and uh, anesthesiologists and surgeons and all that stuff. Okay. The neighborhood has completely changed. We have a lot of different professions in here. OK, because the price of the money has come down and now people that uh, uh, more people from different uh, walks of life can afford to be in our neighborhood because the mortgage payments are much lower. OK, when I moved here, it wasn't quite that way. But what's happening here is we basically brought future demand into the present at the time. And by doing that, you're stealing the you're stealing the demand from the future pilot into the day to have a great today. But then what happens tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day? The only way we're going to come out of this is if we have a complete new monetary system. All the debt has got to be repudiated globally because all, who is that owed to? Is the, all the debt is owed to the Bank for International Settlements. They can go down with the whole thing. We're going to go, we're going to leave them with a the debt. We're going to take away their fiat currency. They're all going to be gone anyway. Then we're going to return back to sovereign money, each offered by each individual state, not country, sovereign country. In the United States, we're going to go back to the American Silver Eagle. Now, this re recording here will probably be around for a little while, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Test me out and see whether or not I'm true, I'm correct. But see, the only time you're going to be able to find out if I'm correct is after it's already happened. So 
I guess my question would be, if I have a pedigree, if I know what I'm talking about, 27 years of experience, zero complaints, zero in 27 years, that's because of the interim clause they put in all the different trusts. Never had a complaint. Now, I never offered silver, never suggested people buy silver because if I did, it would be called selling away and I'd lose my job. I'd be fired from ING immediately. You can't offer something uh, that isn't sold by ING. So, again, for instance, let's suppose you're working for Ford and a young company, country, uh, couple comes in there looking for a reliable van. And you know the Toyota Sienna is the best van, but you're working for Ford. And you dislike these people so much that, geez, you really need to go to the Toyota dealership and get yourself a Sienna. We have crap here for vans. How long would you have a job? You can't tell the truth out there. I've been through $10,000 so far in the last seven days trying to get this up and running. You guys did your part. We put the first, we put the fish in the water or the, the bait in the water on uh, last uh, uh, March 1st with you, Ron. And the response was so overwhelming. But it still took me about five or six days to decide that I was going to open up the piggy bank more and, uh, and really go first class with this thing. So the first 10,000 is gone and we're now looking for some sponsors and one guy is stepping up and I'd like to have a board that I can do math problems for you and explain things and be able to move uh, pictures around myself so that we can keep it all going. So Ron isn't, you know, uh, having as much challenge and everything uh, trying to keep up because um, <laughs> I'm trying you're doing a great job. I mean, I don't know anybody keep up. Nobody can. With, with, with hey, the look, I'm on the screen again, Ted. I'm on the screen. Yeah, well, Ted is Ted has invested in and his wife, uh, Margaret Ann, have invested a tremendous amount of effort and resources into this. Again, there's links to all his information below. But I want to I want to give you a break, Ted, for a second. There's can one we, more. Can I cover just one more thing, please? Yeah, let me let me. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Hold on here. All right. Hold on. Let me put you on full screen, Ted. Okay. What do you have there? This is the withdrawal of the M2 money supply. Folks, has it ever happened in history? Folks, yeah. why in the world would I come out of retirement, spend my own money to educate you if this wasn't really serious stuff? It is. It is serious. Ted, you I'm gonna pull up the debt. Ted, I'm gonna pull up the debt clock and show people visually oh, okay. with my pointer. Yep. There's the M2 money supply, guys. 20 trillion. Yeah. But if you look there, it is shrinking. And, and I want to throw this in, Ted. What yeah. I've heard on the M2 money supply is the only other times that it shrunk, I think, were during the Depression, yes. the Great Depression, or yeah. like basically during periods of it's very unusual for the M2 money supply to shrink. And yeah. at any time in the past when it did, it was a harbinger for not good things to come. And I want to run over here real quick. This was a big mm -hmm. point. People freaked out about the dollar to silver ratio and the dollar to gold ratio being zero. That's because, and I want to show you guys this again one last time. If you hover over that, okay, that's because it's a ratio that compares uh, the year over year increase in the M2 money supply divided by the yearly world production of silver. But since the M2 money supply is shrinking. That's mm -hmm. why we have a zero over there. Back to you. Okay, stay on that screen, Ron. Please stay. Uh, Can you go back to that screen? I got a yes, surprise. Sir. Yes, sir. Do you see where it says open secret window? Yes. So get on the get on out. USdebtclock.org. I'd like I'm gonna you open it, Ted. Okay, click on it. Here we go. I, th I think we saw this yesterday during my lives. Yeah, yeah. There's you the that. okay. So the debt clock is giving us um, clues that it's about run its course. So the United States restoration, we're coming out of the Federal Reserve, okay? The Federal Reserve represents the fiat currencies that have been created, okay? And it keeps everybody in debt because the fiat, the, the Federal Reserve only issues notes and notes are debt instruments. So you're basically collecting debt instruments. And what I'm suggesting that you do is think outside the box a little bit. You already are, that's why you're here on the show. Take the, the take the redemption certificates while you can and exchange them for the currency of the realm. Currency of the realm is what money is actually legitimate in your country. Is the United States dollar constitutionally legitimate in the United States of America? I ask that to you folks. I showed you this in the um, in the Constitution here. Do you think that the current money that we're current current fiat currency, the present fiat currency that we're using, is constitutional? unconstitutional. If it's unconstitutional, there's something called fruit of the poison tree. It's a legal term.
Okay. Something just happened to my computer here. Anyway, yep. the, uh, the fruit of the poison tree says that anything beyond the point where the, where the root, where the fruit got, or where the tree got poisoned is poisonous in of itself. So let's suppose that, um, uh, let's suppose that you try to, inform. all right, let me give a real bad example. Okay. Uh, I bought a pound of cocaine from Ron. All right. <laughs> Just for the record, I'm not a cocaine dealer. Okay, okay, thank you. And what happened was I decided not to pay Ron. Okay. So Ron decides to take me to court. Can Ron sue me for non payment of a pound of cocaine or however it's sold? Ron, can you sue? Me? Could you sue me in court for not having paid you for, for the cocaine? I don't know. I would think not since it's a no, right? it has yeah, to have I don't know because I'm not in that line of business. I was. Well, I'm not that, but I was in the contract business. I know about right. contract law. Okay, right. I never got a cocaine. I was yeah. using that as an example because because it's illegal. They you were using that be illegal. Okay. Right. right. Otherwise we would simple. otherwise right. we would use bananas or uh or uh, a car or something like that. But that's legal. I could sue I, you I over a car. An example of bananas a car would shake it would sh give them a shake by the collars as much as <laughs> cocaine would, okay? Right. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that because I didn't pay Ron, OK, can Ron take me to court and force me to pay Ron for the pound of cocaine? The answer is no, it's not an enforceable contract. OK, so if you get back to the Constitution and all these fake judges, you're seeing that with Fannie Willis. And, you know, it's whatever the big, big uh, butted lady that uh, that was trying to prosecute Trump through her office hired the boyfriend Wade, I think. And they use it basically as slush fund to travel around the world and have fun. And, hey, well, I know you did this before, never prosecuted a former president. But, hey, here's 650 k Let's go have some fun and see what you do. <laughs> it's, our country doesn't work that way. Come on, folks. It's time to – we are identifying who the bad players are. And it's really easy to get them out at this point in time. Hey, so Ted. Who are they coming out? Ted, I want yes. to talk about we've, – we've talked about uh, potential financial – uh, disruptions in in the coming years. We've talked about worst case scenario, even even though we're told it'll never happen again, but potential for financial crisis, right? Even though it happened in 08 to you know, whatever, uh, and it's happened all throughout history. But I want to look at an example of kind of where it's unfolding right now, because I think this is very interesting. If we look at other examples throughout the world, I'm going to pull up a quick article for us about Egypt. Bear with me here. As I pull this up, and um, this is an article written by a gentleman named Ken Silva. Report: Egyptians are trading in gold amidst a fiat for a currency collapse. Says oh, the government. Hold it. You, hold it. You, you have to say that right. They're not trading in their gold. They're trading in gold. Trading okay? in gold, in, not so trading, not trading in. in their gold. Okay. Right. Uh, in the fiat currency, they're using gold instead of fiat currency. All right. Yeah. Yeah. They're trading. With gold, with. maybe might be. Yeah, maybe. that's what okay. I would say. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. We'll 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 contact him and have him rewrite that title. The government announced in November that it was partnering with a financial technology company to install ATMs that would dispense gold bars instead of cash. Bear, just I hold on this. here. <laughs> hold on, I Ted. Hold this. on. In what could be a harbinger of things to come for the United States of America, the New York Times yeah. reported this week that Egyptians are flocking to gold. Hold on, Ted, and I'm going to let you say whatever you want. I'm um, fighting the Ted. As, as, their, as the country's fiat currency, also known as paper money, <laughs> unicorn fart dust, whatever you want to call it, uh -huh. the name of their currency is the pound collapses, Okay. Uh, the March 5th article reported demand for gold in Egypt was more than doubled and that the value of the yellow metal has increased by more than 30 percent. But I want to talk about silver. OK, it says here the market grew so fevered that the government announced in November that they're going to start these gold dispensing ATMs. Reuters here, silver Reuters. OK, you got New York Times Reuters. Can you send this to me. I like this. Can you say? Yeah, this to me? OK, Reuters reported last month that the price of one gram of silver more than doubled in a year to 47 Egyptian pounds, though it remains far cheaper than gold, uh, the price of a gram of 21 karat gold rose, blah, blah, blah. Here, this is what's interesting. Quote, this is a quote, and I heard this a few weeks ago. Uh, quote, silver is the new gold, said a salesman at the Cairo silver store. 
uh, he told Reuters. Now, I want to go, uh, go ahead. You can say a few things, but then I want to pull up a chart of um, of silver in Egypt. Ted, any thoughts on what I just showed you? Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah, man. I was about ready to jump into your screen and bust through the TV set here. Okay, uh, so what's up on what's up on the screen now? What the viewers are seeing, they're seeing a chart of uh, silver in mm -hmm. Egypt. Uh, yeah. that is uh, not that long. It's like, the, I think it's a two year chart mm -hmm. and, uh, it, we can see here, um, uh, on the far right side that in the last month alone, silver has gone from about, oh, let's say 700 Egyptian pounds all the way up to looks like about 1200 Egyptian pounds. Probably. Does a, it look like it's going to slow down anytime soon? No, it does not. No, oh, okay. Do you <laughs> think that, do you think that the proclivities in Egypt might tr might be a contagion that might run over here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the, okay. the, what's causing this in Egypt are the same things that we're dealing with in the United States. Although mm -hmm. we still are the most powerful country in the world and the dollar, although in trouble is still the most powerful currency in the world. I guess the question is, are, does that insulate us? Uh, do are we are we uh, excused in the United States from having to deal with the basic laws of mathematics? That's a very very good question that you're asking, and I th and I think it has a very straightforward answer. We're all humans. We're all on the same planet. Okay, yeah. we all need one another to to get along and have the best life possible. There are certain resources that are available in other parts of the world that aren't available in other parts of the world. Uh, for instance, maybe we have greater technology and maybe uh, Africa has blood diamonds or something. We got to get all this straightened out. We have to get on an even keel because an hour of time in one part of the planet should be equal to an hour of time in another part of the planet. But because we have this uh, this exchange stabilization fund that has been getting, intervening in the Forex markets, they've been rigging the markets to keep the dollar up. OK, so this whole thing is simply simply a lot of air. But. I'm not going to say this, but I'm going to say it, okay? Let's suppose that I was going to tell you that the dollar would be dead by Friday of this week. All right. You're not yeah. saying that. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if I were to tell you that, that the dollar were, was going to be dead by Friday, what would you do? Would you take the dollar bills or digital proxies for it and get the real money while you can? Would you sit and wait to see whether or not I'm right? Let's suppose that I'm wrong. What's the harm? Is the money, is silver finite? Are type ones finite? Are they hard to get? Are, are is junk silver hard to get? You're going to find folks when this happens, it's going to happen like that. I'm telling you. And you're not going to be able to get any silver. It's going to be as Andy Sheckman has said, un unobtainium. Andy Sheckman says exactly that. Like it happened. There's a law. I forget what it is, but it, it happens very slowly. It's kind of like Jenga, right? That Jenga well, game where you, where you yeah. pull. It's you called pull. a crack up boom is what you're talking about. Well, no, it's not. That's not the term. Right. I know what a crack up, but no, he talks about it's like Jenga, right? Like you pull yes. a piece out, you pull a piece yeah. out. Everything's great. Everything's great until it's not, till it all crashes down. I want to, I want to circle back to what you were just saying. If, if we knew that a by crash is what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, basically yeah. two times two is four, four times four, 16, yeah. 16 times 16. And before you know it, it, the crash is there. And we're actually on the horizontal. Uh, it's called a hockey stick is where we are right now in terms of money creation. Right. So in debt, in debt creation. Well, in debt creation. Well, all the, all the currency that is created is in fact debt. The only thing right. that's an asset is this. Yeah. Okay. And what's the, what's, why is there a problem understanding this? You understand the problem understanding this normalcy bias. It's exactly what it is. Okay. But this is money. It always has, oops, okay. It always has been, always will be after I'm dead and gone and you and everybody else, this is still going to be around. Like I said, they're still pulling it off the floor of the Atlantic ocean. Now it has barnacles on it and that kind of stuff, but it didn't have value. Why would they be forming companies to go out uh, with big exploration ships and go down and pull it up? You yeah. know it has value. Why don't they put the dollar bills? That's sludge in the back of the of the safe, as we saw in the movie Titanic, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me let me. I want to I want to finish what I was saying earlier, Ted, okay. because you talked about the uh, if we knew that on Friday, uh, which we're not predicting, but if we did that, the dollar'd be worthless uh, or worthless, that people would rush out to get rid of their dollar. Well, hold on, hold on. If, whoa, whoa, whoa! Wait, 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 Ted. What if in 1971? 
right? Because we know that since 1971, the U.S. dollar has lost 98% of its value relative to gold. What if someone had told told you that in 1971, right? I mean, uh, that, that, hey, guess what? Congratulations, over the next 50 or so years, uh, the US, your U.S. dollars are going to lose 98% of their value against gold. I mean, you know, uh, I think the I think the answer is pretty evident, pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> what I'm going to say is you were saying, suppose if, you know, uh, the value of the dollar goes down or whatever. I'm telling you, it's going to be down by Friday. You wanted me to tell you, you want to show you how you go back to the U.S. debt clock. How can you have a constantly increasing debt? OK. And how can you have a constantly increasing uh, proxies against the money as represented by the currency and credit derivatives? Can we get that up again? I'm getting it up. I think I somehow hold on. Ooh, I don't want to do that. Go ahead. Keep talking, Ted. Right. I'll pull it up. So how in the world can the dollar even maintain its current purchasing power if by Friday they will have increased the debt and they will have increased the currency and credit derivatives against a shrinking pool of M2 money supply? Is the dollar going to become worth less, not worthless, but worth less by Friday? Incrementally, yeah. yes. Okay. In real, yes. in real, in real, I want to throw this in, in real terms, real yes. terms, Purchasing relative, power. relative terms by Friday, we could say, oh, the DXY index went from 103.5 to one, you know, they, that's relative. That's, that's make believe synthetic. That's comparing the dollar to the Euro in the yen. That's like comparing the three, the three best patients uh, in a hospice ward. I mean, I hate to mm -hmm. use that example. So, but in real terms, look up in the upper left-hand corner, guys, right there. That tells you, right? Look down here, uh, you know, uh, look at all these debt levels going up, 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 and up. And that tells you that in real terms, the dollar will be losing value. I, I would have a question. How much silver do you think the United States of America actually has? And if they have any, why isn't it listed on the United States Treasury balance sheet after 1965? Do you see this, folks? I mean, um, do we need to keep rehashing the same thing? Because there's other stuff we need to go over. I mean, yeah. all you guys have an estate and you need an estate plan at some point in time. What I would like to do at some point in time, once we get past the, the monetary side of this and we got you all set up properly, because of your time, that window will close and you won't have any opportunity to get any more silver. When that happens, then it's time to start talking about estate planning. But until yeah. that time, I decide to bring everything forward. You have to get the silver, folks. OK, it's what under, underpins everything else. The demand for silver is skyrocketing for for solar panels, for electric, for uh, for electronics, uh, for money. Now, seven point eight billion people do the math. They're going to each need two point five ounces or two point five units of silver per day in order to live. They got to be exchanged. See, no man's an island. We all have to to rely on one another. And, and then you got economies of scale. I mean, maybe one guy is really good at um, at making tires. Okay, and you can make a thousand of them a day. Another guy, he makes rims and he makes a thousand of them a day or whatever. If I'm going to make my own tire, I'm going to make my own rim. We're out of the ballpark. I don't have the economies of scale. So we all have to rely on one another in order to trade. But how do we trade honestly? If he needs to sell rims to buy food, and I only have tires. How in the world is he going to get tired? How's, how's he going to get food with tires? How's he going to get food with, with rims? So the purchase, the purpose of money is to provide an even system of account so that you can buy and trade what it is you need when you need it. But if you're holding bars and rounds, which are not recognizable money in the country that you're in, you're going to have to go to a second party. You might have to go to a, to a coin store or something or take a lot less than what this would be worth. So if this is $3 more or $4 more, I don't know what, the, what it is, ask Pimbex. Again, I'm not here to sell metal or whatever. I'm here to educate. Yeah, Ted. And at some point, I am interested uh, in hearing from you. Not today, because we got to wrap this up. We've been, oh my gosh, we've been live for an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, but I do want to hear from you. Like, I studied accounting at a top tier university. I worked for a big four accounting firm. Uh, I've got wills set up for my wife and I and my parents uh, but I don't really understand what a trust is. So I'm, I don't want to hear it now, but at some point we're going to do a show once once everything kind of, you know, calms down a little bit where I, I, in simple everyday terms, you can explain to me like what a trust is. I do want 
to also mention, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you guys want to hear more Ted today, he's going to be on the Stacking Surfer at 4 o'clock Eastern. Is that correct, Ted? Uh, I think it's 6 o'clock Eastern. And 6 o'clock Eastern. Big Six shout out to Jared. He's a hell of a guy. Yeah, you yeah. There's one thing I don't like about that guy, though. I got to be honest. Uh, there's one hair. thing I really don't like about the Stacking yeah. Surfer. But if you guys want to go to the Stacking Surfer and get more Ted, uh, he's going to be on there at 6 Eastern. Um, yeah, but there's just one thing that really bugs me about this Stacking Surfer guy. Can I tell you what it is, Ted? Sure. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that I'm stuck in my basement doing this in the middle of the country and he's out wherever in California and he gets to surf and make and make videos about about silver. So, uh, no, Ron, I really like your him. Time is coming, Ron. I came here for a reason. <laughs> God has blessed you. Maybe your, I'll... <laughs> your subscribers are going to go up. Oh, by the way, folks, I want to wait, 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 wait. I want to reiterate that was I was I, I kind of joked around and I've never met him. I don't know, him, but I like his content and I know you speak highly of him. But I like him. I thought, how come this guy gets to be a surfer and I'm in the basement? You know, I'm, maybe I need to be on a sailboat someday. But no, Ted will be <laughs> on the Stacking surfer today at six o'clock. You do need to be on a sailboat. We all need yeah. to be on a sailboat. Hey, I want to let you know we are planning a convention. A group of uh, speakers of us are going to be getting together in Buckhead, Georgia, probably sometime in early June, and we're going to be looking for speakers. I would like to reach out to Keith Newmeyer. I think he has a hell of a company. I think he's a very, very smart guy. I like the integrated nature of what he's doing, and I don't think he's being properly represented in the media. And I think that we need to pay a little bit more attention to, and I mean, excuse me, to uh, to Keith. I think there's a real good beef on the bone there with this guy. I think he's very smart, and I think that he might have a couple aces up his sleeve uh, in terms of information and that kind of thing. Um, let me let me interject. I've 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 met Keith Newmeyer digitally and done and done um, a seminar one time with him. He's the chairman of uh, First Mining Gold. And I want to, I agree with you. I call Keith like one of the members of royalty within the silver community. Yeah. Keith coined the term triple digit silver. Mm -hmm. And what he's doing now, which is very interesting, is uh, with his company, First Majestic mm -hmm. Silver, they actually started a mint uh, in Nevada mm -hmm. where he is uh, minting different silver products, which he will make available directly to the invest, re retail investing community. So the silver that he's mining down in uh, Mexico and not all of it uh, yet, right? right? Uh, but he's, he's, he's completely integrated the whole chain from That's smart. Digging, it, digging it up out of yep. the ground. And, and, and I think from what I've heard from him that you know mm -hmm. the intention obviously is, excuse me, that they get as much of that silver that you know, uh, processed through that mint as yeah. it grows and get it directly into the hands of investors. But yeah, Keith Newmeyer is loved in the silver community. Um, you know, he's, he's been a big proponent and a big warrior for the silver cause. He's a self-smoking pretty good kind of guy. You, you know, when he speaks, right. you gotta listen. Um, yeah. Well, one last thing I want to share with you, what's happening now is that um, there, there are lots of thousand ounce bars out there and um, they're having trouble moving them. So what's been happening is uh, Golden Eagle Coin, what they tried to do is saw the gold, the, uh, the, the thousand ounce bars in the slab, so to speak. But the saw wouldn't saw through the silver. You know why? It gummed up the blades. It gummed up the teeth of the, of the saw. So then what happened? They said, well, OK, let's go and get a acetylene torch and see if we can cut the bars in half or whatever. They're heavy to move. Turns out, because of the particular properties of silver, and I thought this fascinating. Tell me whether or not you were on the same wavelength here. That the acetylene torch would not cut the silver. You know why? Because silver is such a great dissipator of energy that it couldn't concentrate the energy long enough in one particular spot with an acetylene torch in order to cut the bar. So now what we have come up with, we've come up with ways to slice the bar with hydraulic slicer, take the slices of the thousand ounce bar, lay it on a scale, weigh it, stamp the, the weight of the bar as well as the uh, the logo. And now you got one of the cheapest bars you could probably get. But the question would be, how negotiable is it? Here, we take this slab of silver for a pound of steak or whatever. No, you have to have the coin of the realm, folks. Yeah. Be smart with your money and get, get be careful, be smart, be intelligent and buy quality. Yeah. Buy yeah. quality. You never yeah. go wrong yeah. buying quality.
And listen to what Ted says. Listen to what Ron says. Listen to what Andy Sheckman says. Listen to uh, what your mom and dad say. Listen to everybody. Listen and make to what it- the Bible says. Didn't God say um, uh, silver and gold are mine, saith the Lord? Yeah. Make up, make up your mind for yourself. Right? We can all. Ted can can speak Ted's truth. I can tell you, you know, what I tell you is my truth. But make up your own mind. For yourself, Ted, I want to say thank you for joining us today. It's been another uh, awesome live stream. We were over a thousand people, uh, which is a new live? record. Yeah, live. live. Yeah, live for Ron's basement. So I want to remind everybody if you want to get more Ted today, you can go to the Stacking Surfer, who I like. I want to reiterate, I was just joking around that one thing I don't like about him that he gets to surf and I get to roll around on an office chair. We'll have in my you up basement. in the attic pretty soon, Ron. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but that'll be six o'clock Eastern time tonight. Mm-hmm. Ted, uh, we'll plan on seeing you next Friday at our normal time, 10 a.m. Central. Unless I'm sure something we'll have... comes up, unless yeah, something we'll... comes up, I'm going to give you a call and say, we got to go live. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. Maybe and there's links clues here, folks. Better pay attention. There, there's links. Date, but there's give links. Clues. There's links to all of Ted's information in the description. Ted, again, thank you for being here, and uh, we will see you next time.